Welcome everyone. I'm Laura Blyle. I am the Director of External Engagement at the Research Park. Um, as everybody knows, this has been a, a unique year and um, it's allowed us to change our programming up, but in some ways it's also allowed us to reconnect with uh, some of our favorite entrepreneurs over the years. So I don't know if Zeba knows this, that she's one of our favorites, but um, it's been a long time, but she's one of those one of those people who's somewhat unforgettable. And so we've connected, we connected over LinkedIn and I've had the opportunity to watch her, uh, uh, watch her career as it has evolved over the years, but more probably significantly, she's also, kept her University of Illinois connections intact. And I know that she's going to probably tell us a little bit about how she's stayed connected to a startup that uh, actually resulted um, from part of her studies as well. And a, a company that is graduating from the incubator actually as we speak. So um, so there's, there's lots of ties here. So we are very fortunate to have Zeba join us today to talk a little bit about her entrepreneurial journey um, as a serial, a very young serial entrepreneur. I was on the uh, talking to a, to a guy yesterday who's, um, you know, has more years behind him than you do. And I just was kind of cracking up thinking that, you know, for somebody as young as you are, you have done so many different things. And I think that's why uh, we are delighted to have you here today and to talk, to reflect and to talk about these things and also to hear what's next for you. So welcome Zeba and uh, take it away. Yeah, th thanks a lot for the introduction, Laura. And good afternoon, everyone who has joined in. Uh, I'm really honored to talk to this group. Um, I very fondly remember uh, the times when I used to be sitting through the Startup Cafe talks, um, you know, 10 years back, actually. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, they, they used to be, I, I mean, I mostly was drawn to these talks, mostly for the non-pizza lunches, like the lunches used to be really fancy <laughs> then, but uh, I learned a lot. Like, I mean, I remember being inspired at each and every of the talks and um, I'm really glad that I'm able to, you know, at least uh, contribute uh, to this uh, series uh, after a decade. Mm -hmm. So I hope everybody is doing well. Um, everybody's staying safe. Uh, and the holidays are almost around, around the corner. So hopefully everybody is getting up for the holidays too. Uh, so at least some celebration and end of the year. Um, so yeah, I mean, today uh, my plan is to just go through my, dick, you know, the last 10 years of, you know, what have I done? Um, and uh, I mean, I, I call it entrepreneurship comes in all shapes and sizes because I've sort of you know, uh, dabble, da I would say dabbled into a lot of things and, you know, tried a, a number of different things. So I'll, I'll talk through those and I'll actually uh, come back with lessons that I've learned so far. Um, so yeah, before I get started though, I just wanted to introduce myself and uh, where I come from. Um, so uh, my name is Zeba Parkar. I grew up in India, um, precisely, uh, actually in Mumbai, which is a, a, a city on the West Coast. And uh, while growing up as a kid, I, um, I always was fascinated by um, understanding how things work. Um, and I always dreamt about being an inventor. I, I always, you know, I mean, if you see some slam books and, uh, you know, things that I've written uh, of, you know, my goals, I always said I wanted to be a noble, noble laureate. So um, I, I mean, I always uh, wanted to do that uh, as a kid, but then when uh, I was good at science, I really liked science. I was good in academia. Um, and as an Indian who's, who's good in academics, you know, you have two choices. You either become a doctor or an engineer. And of course I chose uh, to be an engineer. Um, so I, um, I went to, um, uh, went and did my bachelor's in uh, polymer engineering uh, at, at a school called Institute of Chemical Technology in Mumbai. Um, and there I, uh, I mean, at that time I was thinking, you know, I really enjoyed, you know, learning all about chemical engineering, uh, polymer engineering, and I wanted to learn more. So, um, and I felt like, you know, I want, I mean, I want to be a professor. So at that point I decided that, you know, I, um, 
I, I would, I want to just go and get my PhD. Uh, I had an idea of, you know, what I wanted to do my research in because I did some undergraduate research when I was in school. So um, I ended up, you know, applying uh, and um, I uh, chose the University of Illinois um, for my PhD program. Um, and those five years at uh, Illinois were sort of the most formative years uh, for, uh, for me. Um, in terms of, you know, not only uh, technical, but then also, you know, understanding uh, myself and what I liked and what I wanted to do. Uh, one of the major changes was, you know, I decided um, against actually uh, pursuing a career in academia. Um, I ended up, I, and, I mean, I decided that I wanted to sort of uh, do something in, you know, the industry. So I wanted to actually uh, make uh, make some, I mean, rather than doing academic research, I wanted to make uh, new things for the world. So uh, there I, and there was an introduction there, I actually also got introduced to entrepreneurship, which I'll talk more about. Um, and then I, uh, at that point, you know, I, I ended up uh, working for 3M almost for six and a half years as a research specialist. Um, and I had a very enriching experience there too. Um, which we'll go through. And then um, right now I'm working on a couple of different uh, projects, but then the main is uh, called Contours, which I'm working on uh, launching sometime uh, next year. So spring of next year. Um, and then, um, yeah, I mean, personally um, I have, uh, I mean, I'm mother to two uh, elementary age kids. Uh, they keep me very busy. Uh, and then also in terms of my free time, uh, I love love playing board games, um, and also I'm a gardener, so I have uh, I have I mean I do a lot of you know outdoor gardening, but also container gardening. So I have a lot of you know terrariums and plant. I mean I have almost 150 house plants at home, so it's uh, that's that's some yeah I mean that's something that keeps me sane. So um, yeah, I mean today I'm going to go through the journey and some lessons that I've learned. Uh, uh, maybe I'll take a pause in in the middle, and then we um, I'll try to end you know at least 15 20 minutes before, uh, so that we have uh, time for discussion, questions, anything like that. So um, the journey so far, I can sort of split it into three uh, subcategories. Uh, the first uh, phase is you know being a student entrepreneur, which probably lasted only a year and a half um, or so uh, during the end of my PhD. Um, and this was sort of, this ended up being a very gentle introduction to uh, what entrepreneurship is all about. And I think, uh, you know, we'll talk more about, you know, what I did then. And then uh, after that, I ended up taking a corporate job. Um, and while working as a, you know, in the corporate setting, I, I sort of started getting sort of anxious and I started a side hustle um, so that um, I was testing the waters and sort of trying to get back to what I was thinking I wanted to do. Um, and then, you know, the last couple of years where I've been, um, you know, full time, uh, a full time entrepreneur, uh, I'm, I've tried a few different things, uh, you know, from my main uh, job, but then uh, still it's, uh, it's, it's been really rewarding and um, I mean, I don't, I'm excited to know what comes next. So um, one of the main things that for every phase, you know, one of the main things that I think about um, at every junction is, you know, two main things. One is uh, money. Um, and I mean, money, although uh, I think money is pretty important uh, and being cognizant of that uh, and understanding, you know, where you stand at every junction is important. Um, and then the second piece of the puzzle is, you know, you yourself and being self-aware and understanding and maximizing, uh, are you maximizing your potential um, at every stage or anything you do? Um, if you can do match both of them and, you know, maximize both of them, that's sort of a win-win for all. Um, and I mean, I'll, through the talk, I'll go through, you know, how uh, I was evaluating each one of these uh, before making my next move. So um, in, in terms of money, um, I, I think it's a means to an end, uh, but uh, still, you know, you need to have positive cash flow. Um, I mean, you need to sort of understand, like have a very clear understanding of, you know, this is the absolute amount of money I need 
uh, to live. So, I mean, this is how much rent, uh, food, clothing, and this is like the bare minimum. So you, you need to sort of have a plan of how am I going to get that? Um, and then um, the other part is, you know, if you're running a business, there are these startup costs that, you know, even before money come, starts coming into the door, you have to, uh, you know, put in some money and that start, you know, being cognizant of that startup cost uh, is also important. So, I mean, uh, at every stage I, I've evaluated this um, and sort of, you know, being, it's very important to be cognizant because if you are struggling just to be, even make ends meet, it's really hard to focus and run a business. So um, understanding this is really important. The second part that I always, you know, it's something that um, I have to make an effort and make sure, you know, I'm doing this at every junction is uh, being very self-aware. Um, so self-awareness is um, important because, uh, you know, you need to be cognizant of, okay, what what is my motivation of doing this? And, you know, why am I doing it? You know, should I be doing something else rather than doing this? Uh, what is this some is this a good fit for my skill set? So uh, being very aware of you know your strengths, your weaknesses. Uh, I like this concept of uh, founder startup you know sort of fit, um, and I think you need to be sort of cognizant of that. That okay, is this something that I mean? Uh, is this something that you know I can bring a lot to the table? Um, so uh, for me, um, I think what I have been doing. Uh, and being very cognizant of is uh, being able to slow down um, and think through things and trying to build that into your weekly schedule. So um, I know it, it might sound cheesy, but uh, you know, journaling definitely helps, um, you know, uh, basically just keeping like half an hour a week and making sure you're, uh, you're on track and you're doing what you really uh, set out to do. So, um, so yeah, I mean, so the entire talk will be contextualizing these two concepts while also talking through my, um, you know, journey. So, um, I mean, at Illinois, uh, I had a really, really good time. The last year and a half, um, I sort of stumbled upon this uh, idea of, oh, I could actually start a, start my own company. Um, and that happened, um, you know, through, uh, and I was, uh, I was very fortunate to be involved in two startups, uh, one of which was um, ATSP Innovations, which, which just graduated from the research park. Uh, and uh, and that, that, that uh, particular startup was based on uh, some of the PhD research I was doing. So, um, so, so that was, uh, uh, I mean, I, I basically held out initially uh, to write the first the first SBI grant and you know setting up the structure of the company and things of that sort. Um, the other um, idea or concept that I was working on then was called Milk Shield, um, and it was this you know a side project that I started when I was doing my work uh, around uh, how can you preserve you know liquid foods, especially milk, without having to refrigerate them. Um, and you know I I at that point of time um, a I was able to prototype the product, um, actually sample sample it to a few people, and you know get some initial data. Um, and through through this experience of both the both the startups I was involved in, um, one of the things that I discovered was um, I really enjoyed creating something from nothing. So uh, in both cases, it was you know the thrill of you know, create. I mean, identifying a problem and then solving that problem. And then being able to think about how can I help somebody else to uh, get that problem. Um, also through that experience, I was able to, uh, I mean, I was able to meet a lot of student entrepreneurs. Um, there was this uh, community of you know, really creative uh, st students out there. Um, and I mean, I, I, was, I was really inspired by all of them. And I felt like, you know, this is, this is the path I need to be on. Um, unfortunately, you know, at that point of time, uh, I, of course, I evaluated the money and the maximizing your potential. You know, of course, I mean, I was uh, a graduate student, had no money. Um, and, um, you know, there was another uh, convoluting factor, which was, uh, you know, the immigration, which I was an F F1 student and trying to work on your startup was not trivial. So, um, so at that time, um, and also the other part was, you know, uh, 
I figured I was very good at, you know, making things, but I didn't, I knew nothing about how to run a business and how to actually sell anything. And I felt like, you know, I mean, I, there was, there were a lot of mentors and people that were helping out, but I, I always felt like, you know, I, I need to sort of, uh, actually I'd never worked. Right. I mean, I, I, from bachelor's, I directly went to a PhD program. So I was like, okay, I need to get a real job and actually just learn the ins and outs of how things work before I actually try to start my own company. So, um, so at that time, my evaluation was, okay, this, this, needs to wait and I need to get out and get, get a job. So um, the plan was, uh, okay, I'm going to go get a corporate job and find a job where I can, uh, I, get, I get to work with intelligent people. I get a lot of mentoring and I can move on to the next step. So uh, that's, why, that's what I did. I, um, I ended up going um, and uh, working um, for, I mean, getting a corporate job um, there, I mean, it was, it was just amazing in the sense that, um, first of all, um, I mean, as a researcher, you know, I, I always worked as an individual, right? Uh, I mean, you might be collaborating with one other person or two other people, but uh, it, was, it was never a big team. Uh, so one of the things that was sort of fascinating for me is, you know, you have these teams of like 20 and 30 people who are working together. Um, and how, how, how does that work? And, you know, how do you make sure everybody is, you know, on track and you're launching this right product at the right time? Um, I learned a lot about project management. I learned a lot about um, uh, processes, you know, how, what processes are used by big corporations for, you know, developing a product, launching a product, things of that sort. So, I mean, it was just invaluable sort of training uh, that I got through, through those six years. Um, you know, the things that, I mean, I, I really liked my job, but then the things that I did not like was, um, I was, I was not able to get the, uh, I mean, there was quite a bit because, you know, you're working with so many people, um, you end up getting caught up in a lot of, uh, bureaucracy and politics, which I hated. Uh, and then the second thing that was sort of that, the thing that was not, uh, that, that sort of, uh, made me sort of jump the wagon was uh, actually uh, having very little autonomy in major decisions. So, I mean, of course I could make decisions on my small project, but then when it came to, okay, is this going to launch? I mean, there were times when you worked on something for two years and it just sort of got killed um, and you had no control over it. So things of those uh, sort wherein you're like, you know, you have no uh, control over your destiny sort of thing was sort of bothering me. So, um, I mean, I did my, uh, again, the evaluation of money versus my potential. Um, you know, money was not a problem. I mean, I had, I, I felt like, you know, going from a graduate, graduate student salary to um, a, a six-figure salary was, a, I mean, it, it was a big deal, right? So, um, you know, I, I was able to build up some uh, safety net through that. Uh, but then, you know, I always felt like, you know, I was not doing... Um, all that I could do and I did not have much control. So, uh, you know, I decided that I needed to just get back in and start building something from, I mean, build, build something from nothing. So get back into entrepreneurship. And that this transition was not very easy. Um, and that turns out that it's really, really difficult to leave a steady paycheck. It's really difficult. Uh, I mean, it took me almost two years to take the plunge. Um, and I, I mean, I start, kept on talking in my head saying that, okay, um, I, what if I fail? Like, I mean, are you going to ever get a job this good? You know, I mean, there were a lot of things that were holding me back. Uh, one of the other, um, other important thing was, you know, the imposter syndrome, wherein I'm like, okay, uh, you have learned only the technical function, you know, how, how about you need to learn this more, maybe you need to go and uh, move around in the company rather than getting out. So uh, there's a lot of, you know, self-talk. And I also went under this tangent of, okay, do I need an MBA? Um, and, you know, all, through this two years, my decision was, um, after talking to a lot of people, was, you know, you don't need an MBA to start a business. You just need to start a business to, you know, just just start a business and learn learn through it rather than uh, trying to get another degree. So um, I just, I was like, okay, maybe I should do that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, after that, I started my next phase 
<coughs> which was, which was uh, you know, I was still in the corporate uh, world, but um, I started a side hustle. Um, and um, the side hustle, when I was thinking about it, um, I wanted to um, basically, you know, this was a way of me sort of proving to myself that I can sell and I can run a business. Um, and uh, the business does not, I mean, one of the things that I wanted to do was, you know, I did, I wanted to pick something that was not very technical uh, that I don't have to develop. I mean, the product develop the market for um, and something that is low investment, uh, both in money and time. Um, so uh, what I started with is looking at the e-commerce space and seeing whether I can start selling something online. And um, one of the things that I uh, that I came across is are these handmade shoes um, that are made, um, they are made in India. Um, and I launched, uh, launched it as a crowdsourcing campaign. Um, so um, the idea was I was going to, you know, design the shoes, import it, get them made, um, and then sell them. And because this is a handmade product, uh, you know, there are no, um, there are no like, MOQ, minimum model quantity. So it's like, you know, I don't have to buy 10,000 shoes. I can buy a few hundred shoes and sell them rather than 10,000. So the investment was not something that, you know, I can uh, put in rather than having to go get a loan or, you know, uh, get, get some funding from somewhere. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, so this was sort of the, my first four days. So until now, uh, I had only made things. I'd never sold anything. Uh, you know, even uh, even uh, the initial part, you know, we were just developing the product. We had never uh, sold anything. So uh, in this case, this was the, my first foray into actually trying to sell something. Um, even during my corporate uh, career, I always used to be very dismissive about the marketing and sales per function because of like, you know, why do you need these? I mean, if you make a good product, you can sell it sort of thing. But uh, after this, you know, one of the biggest lessons that I learned was, uh, you know, if you build something, uh, they will not come. Like, I mean, that was the fir first thing that I learned. Um, and, you know, this started with the crowdsourcing campaign, for example. So uh, we made the product. Um, I uh, I had a co-founder. So I had a friend who also was, you know, working with me, uh, helping uh, launch this thing. Um, and then we we did some initial, you know, we uh, we did some initial customer interviews. We sort of, you know, put it up out there, uh, tested. I mean, tested it on a few people, and then I like, okay, we are launching now. We'll be fine. Um, and then, you know, initially some sales came in, and most of the sales were like friends and friends, friends of friends, you know, people who really want to see you succeed. But then after that, crickets. And I'm like, what's going on here? And then, uh, you know, I mean, the naive me saying, oh, we need, I mean, we actually need to market this and not just like market it within a very small circle. It needs to be sort of uh, broadcasted uh, broader. Um, and since then, I mean, uh, since the, the last three years, I know better. And I know that even before you, uh, uh, even before you put something out there, there has to, I mean, unless you uh, build enough awareness around your product, nobody's going to buy it. So uh, even if you have the best, best product ever. So that's one of the things that I learned pretty early on. Uh, the second lesson that I learned was <coughs> market res research and customer, I mean, understanding your customer is critical. Like it's, it's really, really hard to get somebody to actually come to you. I mean, a stranger come to you um, and pay, pay you money to get something. I mean, uh, there is so much competition out there. And I mean, uh, granted, I was in a very, com com I mean, I was in a not very, you know, um, differentiated field in terms of, you know, it's a footwear, it's, it, it has some attributes, but it's still, you know, nothing uh, majorly technically different, but still. <clears throat> so one of the things that, um, that I, um, I mean, we did, we had done some initial customer research but I felt like that was not enough. And I mean, the, we were peeling layers while we were selling these shoes. Um, and, you know, I wish we would have done um, more re uh, market research before actually launching. But I mean, I, uh, you know, there's always a, a fine line as to, you know, how much you can do before you launch uh, versus later. Um, 
the third lesson that I learned uh, while uh, you know running this side, side hustle was get in front of the customer. So, um, you know, as we were selling online, you know, you don't see the customer. It's like, you know, somebody came to your website but did not buy. Why did they not buy? You know, you don't know what's going on in their head versus, you know, you actually uh, being in front of the people and actually talking to them. So uh, we realized that we don't understand what's going on. So we started doing a lot of these pop-up shops and this these used to be, of course, on the weekends because both of us were working full-time jobs. <coughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, this was the eye-opener because, you know, we learned a lot of, uh, I mean, we, we learned a lot by just talking to those 10 people, so 20, 10 or 20 people that we were selling every time. Um, and, you know, you, we learned a lot about, you know, what their problems were um, and how we could solve them. So, uh, so one of the things that I, I feel like we did really, really well was, you know, listen carefully to the customer um, and, uh, you know, figuring out how to solve those problems and whether those problems are worth solving. So one of the major issues that we saw um, in this entire uh, sort of thing was uh, returns of shoes uh, because shoes are not fitting. Customers, customers complaining about uh, not being, not finding uh, shoes that fit them. So, um, I mean, we heard a lot of people saying, oh, I have to buy shoes from the men's section because nobody makes a size 13 shoe or I can never find wide, you know, shoes in this particular style. So, they, they, I mean, most of the, uh, you know, issues that we were hearing were mostly around, you know, of shoes not being made for a particular, you know, shape of foot. Um, so the last, after this, you know, uh, I mean, while we were selling these shoes, one of the concepts that was born was the idea around being able to make shoes based on the shape of the foot um, and uh, being able to uh, size feet um, and that's that's the concept that I've been working on in the last you know year or so. So it's it's a high. I mean, we are using currently the this is the pivot that uh, it's going to be Zakara's, which is the brand uh, that's going to launch next year. But we are using AI uh, to size feet. So based on a couple of pictures of your foot, uh, we can size your foot, and then based on the size, we can make a, make a shoe uh, in an automated fashion uh, that would fit you well. Um, so, so basically, you know, being able to listen to customers and pivoting is another important thing. So uh, while I was doing the side hustle, I think one of the things that I realized was, you know, it's, it's really hard uh, to uh, run something on the side uh, while, um, I mean, so you're working a full-time job and then you're spending another four hours at night uh, trying to, you know, build your um, company. And it was sort of taking a toll on my health too. So uh, finally, um, you know, a f a f after running this for a year and a half uh, on the side, um, I was confident enough that, you know, yes, I can do this. It's not that hard. Um, and I decided to take the plunge, you know, full time. Um, so, uh, so the plan at that point was, okay, I'm going to uh, sort of uh, work on this mass customized shoes um, while working in my corporate job, I had worked on quite a bit on 3D printing. So, you know, looking at the, those technologies uh, to actually bring to the uh, footwear industry. Um, and then while uh, doing that, I also started, I mean, when I, when I went full time, it freed up a lot of time, right? So uh, now I could do things that I always wanted to do. So um, I wanted to reconnect with the uh, the folks at ATSP Innovations um, at the research park. So I started, uh, you know, working with them, uh, helping them with more, uh, you know, business development uh, efforts. Um, also, I started working with other, you know, small businesses uh, that uh, needed, you know, some technical help around, you know, um, just solving some small problems that they cannot solve by themselves. So uh, basically, I mean, I was doing things that I was picking up things that I really felt like, you know, I could make a difference. Um, and also, I mean, I always wanted to teach. So, uh, I mean, because I did not choose to be a professor, I was like, yeah, maybe I can just teach a course at a local university. So I started teaching 
material science and engineering at a local uh, university here too. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it was, uh, it was mostly my full time uh, career with uh, uh, being a full time entrepreneur with a few side hustles. And at this point, you know, I mean, I felt like, um, in terms of maximizing my potential and, you know, doing things I wanted, uh, I had full control over that. So, um, you know, I mean, I was ma maximizing my potential in terms of money front. Um, I had, you know, in the, uh, I had, I have, you know, built up a good safety net. Um, and then, you know, for living expenses, I've been able to uh, somehow, you know, do a few um, uh, consulting things. And then, uh, you know, now that uh, revenue has started coming in through the business, I don't have to uh, do. So, I mean, I've sort of started dropping off some of these um, and focusing on all the other aspects. So, I mean, it, in this part of the, you know, in this part, uh, I think the most important thing for me has been time. Like time is currency right now. It's, you know, everything I do, um, I end up, say, I mean, I end up saying no to a lot of things just because, you know, um, I want to focus and I don't want to uh, move my, I mean, get, uh, do things that are not going to make an impact. Uh, so another, you know, last thing that I wanted to bring up is um, uh, entrepreneurship can be lonely because um, one of the things that, you know, when you're working in a big corporation, you're working with big teams, you have uh, colleagues, you have, you work with like 30 people, people you're seeing people every day. Um, it's not the same when you are sort of, you know, trying to build a, a startup with another co-founder, right? So it's it's like two of you working all the time. Maybe you talk to one or two other people, but not that much. Um, so uh, so it was that transition was kind of hard for me, um, and I felt like um, it's something that you have to be cognizant about, uh, and you have to find your network. And for me, my network, you know, generally is family, um, uh, other entrepreneur friends who are sort of in the same thick thick of things and you can just you know have a call with them and you know talk to them and uh, share some of the uh, experiences that you're having um, or the uh, frustrations you're having so far uh, also um, I've, I've been able to find sort of you know I mean I, I enterprise works does a really good job of this but um, you know uh, we moved to Atlanta so here I've been able to find a uh, uh, a research in, I mean, an entrepreneurship incubator uh, associated with Georgia Tech, which also has a good mentoring network. So I've, I've been able to leverage some of that to help with, you know, specific problems that I have uh, faced. Um, another, you know, last thing, and this was just for fun, uh, that we started, um, you know, maybe three months or three months back was uh, this, uh, I mean, I, I already said that, you know, I'm a plant enthusiast i'm a, i'm a fanatic with plants and i uh, one of the things that you know plant lovers generally do is you know when you're trying to grow your collection you just trade plants so you don't have to buy anything you just take a cutting from your plant and you, somebody else has the other plant and you just trade trade things and um i felt like you know there was no good way of doing this uh, in a reasonable fashion um, except, you know, you have to go to these Reddit groups or Facebook groups and try to find people and go through like hundreds of posts before you find one that you want. Um, so um, that's where, you know, the idea of plant shopper came about. Um, and uh, here, uh, the idea was, you know, I mean, uh, like, I am not a coder, uh, I don't know how to code. So we were uh, we were thinking of figuring out a way of prototyping this uh, and seeing whether it has value to the plant community. And uh, one of the I mean one of the things that I wanted to share with this group is you know if you uh, this entire there's this entire movement around uh, low code no code platforms which which is you know even if you're a coder um, it's a very very fast way of prototyping. And prototyping a tech 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 product without having to you know go in and write you know lines of code, um, and we used uh, one of those low code platforms called Bubble to prototype this. And um, I feel like this was a good way of you know testing the concept, um, and actually with the real users 
um, and figuring and then deciding, okay, is this something that is worth even spending time on or money on? And I think for now, we have decided that, you know, it's something that it's a hobby community. We, we have a prototype up and you know people are using it it's more sort of you know for the plant community and we are going to keep it that way uh, at least uh, in the near future um so so yeah i mean that's that that's sort of you know a gist of my journey uh, so far um i always tell people that you know find your why you know may like a lot of people have different sort of motivations of why they are doing something uh, and uh, you know, there are a lot of whys that you have. For me, you know, these were some of the whys uh, uh, that I had. And um, I mean, you know, find your why and work towards that and build something from nothing. Um, and I mean, as you can see, you know, this is just the beginning. I'm just, I feel like I've, I've been only in this for a couple of years now, full time. And uh, I mean, I'm starting to uh, gain momentum, uh, still have a long way to go, still ha have to learn a lot of things. Um, and I mean, feel free to reach out if I can help in any way. Um, I mean, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I also blog, um, so you can you know follow my blog and uh, see what I'm up to, so. Thank you. Done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have questions out there? Don't be shy, you can unmute yourself. If we don't have any questions, I have a question for you. So um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, your experience with ATSP and sort of what you were doing? You know, you mentioned that it, this was some of the work that they were doing was, uh, came out of your PhD um, research and then coming back to that. Can you just talk a little bit more about how that all happened and what you've been doing with them? And uh, would love to hear that. Yeah, so uh, with ADSP Innovations, uh, you know, uh, the product is the polymer itself. So it's, it's a new material set that's available uh, for high temperature applications. Um, and when I, uh, I mean, I, I was trying to keep, be involved with them uh, while also working uh, at the, uh, at 3M, but uh, it was a conflict of interest because, you know, 3M also makes a lot of polymer products and there were a few products that, uh, uh, that might be sort of competing with this. Uh, so I could not, I mean, I had to sort of divest and could not uh, remain um, sort of involved. Um, so I had, uh, I mean, once I decided, you know, I was not going to work uh, full time, I, 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 I reached out to ATSP to see if I could help out with, you know, sort of more in terms of the uh, business development. So um, the last year or so, um, I helped them sort of I mean, not from the technical perspective, but more from, you know, the business perspective of, you know, how, uh, how like, how, how should they bring, build their brand? What categories of products that should we, you know, sort of have, um, and then, you know, sort of brand, how should we brand them? And then reaching out to potential, you know, uh, uh, customers and helping, helping them build sort of the, their pipeline of uh, leads that they can, they can go and reach out to in terms of, uh, so, I mean, basically building more awareness around the product. And because um, I think being, uh, being a high tech sort of company, um, it's really hard for, sometimes, you know, it's really hard for uh, somebody who is uh, the researcher or the creator of the product to sort of, you know, sell it uh, sometimes. And that's because, you know, you're so roped up into, okay, this is obvious, but for people outside, it's not. So, you know, basically just helping them tell their, sto tell their story and um, helping them, you know, connect with potential customers is what I'd help, up, help them with. And I, I feel like they, they've been doing really well. Uh, I see a comment from Jacob in the chat. Suggestion to use an additional technical term, vitrimer, has been very helpful in drawing in contacts. What does that mean? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I guess, uh, you know, like we, we generally in our internal sort of, you know, communication, we always called our polymer, you know, aromatic thermosetting copolyesters and nobody else knows about it, right? So 
you know, one of the things is, you know, what are the terms people are searching for if they are looking for a high temperature polymer like ATSP and vitrimer was, uh, was the word that, you know, we were not using in any of our communication. So um, I guess we wrote a few articles, uh, put them in like business journals and sort of, you know, yeah. So things, things of that sort, which were sort of, you know, just trying to think uh, from the customer's perspective rather than from an internal perspective. Can you tell us a little bit more about your new project? Um, so AI, I've, I don't think was something you studied during your PhD that you were really, that was way ahead of your time, would have been way ahead of your time. So yeah. um, how did you, you know, those, did you, are those skills that you acquired in your role at 3M or are you partnering with others? How can you talk yeah, a little so bit I about I actually that? have a co-founder who is the, who has the technical skills uh, for, uh, for uh, who has the technical skills for, you know, sort of doing the AI uh, part. But the, the idea behind this is very simple. You know, the shoe industry is sort of all based on this idea of your foot size is just based on a length. And, you know, the, the shoe company decides, okay, this is, this is a fictitious shape that would fit, you know, 60% of the population. And then I'm going to scale this uh, based on the length. And, you know, it just, you, whenever you go shoe shopping, you're just like, you know, you have to try on 10 shoes before you find that one that fits you. Um, and this idea, I mean, I, I met a lot of women who sort of were like, uh, who got bunions because of, you know, cramming their foot into shoes that did not fit them. And they just had wide foot and they could not find shoes that were, you know, the right size. So the concept that we are working on is, you know, the reason why nobody makes shoes based on the shape of their foot is because there's a lot of design time that goes into actually, if, if you want to make a shoe, or you have to actually go in and actually change designs. Uh, so currently we are using AI to uh, automate, automate that entire process. So we are training uh, algorithms to basically design the shoe based on the shape of your foot. And then uh, from my perspective, I'm working more on the manufacturing side. So I've, I've well, I did a lot of work on 3D printing and sort of mass customization in general. So using those concepts and somehow customizing it for each and every individual is what I'm sort of focusing on. But yeah, I mean, it's a technically it's a very hard problem to solve. Um, and that's why it's taking us so long to sort of, you know, even get to the first product. But uh, we we have made a few, uh, you know, I mean, we, we are on track to uh, launch sometime next year. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that. It sounds like a, a great project. And I think uh, maybe some potential customers around here. So keep us posted about uh, launch time. Um, uh, there's a question in the chat. Have you connected to the rehabilitation orthopedic podiatry community to capture a quote, go-to company for individuals who might have differences or changes in their feet? Yeah, I have been in touch with podiatrists and um, I think uh, those those are the potential markets we'll go after, uh, you know, though for, but initially, I mean, I think we are start sort of starting with non-clinical cases just because uh, the, it has, you know, less, uh, you know, barriers to entry, but that's, that's actually the way we are going. I mean, we, we see us as, you know, somebody who uh, initially would, you know, work on the orthopedic po podiatric community, but eventually the vision is to, you know, be able to give people the right kind of shoes that, you know, you don't end up having these issues down the road. So. Great. Oh, here's another one. Uh, again, from Dr. Jones, how about being a company that can work with a national brand to make a couple shoes that can be custom? Is that something that's part of your strategy? Yeah, that's, that, that's something that we have thought about. And I think uh, we have spoken to a few brands. I think the, the issue here is, you know, there have been quite a bit of, uh, you know, companies who have promised uh, custom shoes and they have not delivered on their promise. So a lot of people are skeptical. They're like, oh, you, nobody can, no, you can't do that sort of thing. So uh, I think we have to prove ourselves before, you know, anybody sort of bites on it. Uh, but yeah, that's actually part of the strategy is, you know, once we sort of uh, 
get get ourselves in the market and actually prove prove out the concept with you know 100 200 people then that would be the way to go yeah i have so a question can... oh here go ahead I'm sorry yeah yeah of course thank you so much for the presentation um so i'm a faculty at the school of social work and i'm interested in creating my own company yeah. And I don't know anything. I don't have an MBA and I don't know much about creating companies. So I had two questions for you. One was, can you explain a little bit more about the crowdsourcing campaigns, what they are, what they do? Yes. Um, and then the second question, um, you talked about AI and this is sort of something new to you. Um, mm -hmm. How do you determine when you need a co-founder or somebody with that expertise to come and be part of your company? How do you make that decision? Because I want to develop VR software, but I'm not a VR developer. I'm a social scientist. So how do you determine that? Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, those are really good questions. So I'll, I'll answer the first question around crowdsourcing. Um, I think, you know, if you're making a consumer product, you know, crowdsourcing by far is the best way of, you know, testing out your idea. Um, and the way crowdsourcing works is you... It's, it's sort of a low risk way of funding your uh, company and even getting market insights. So, uh, you know, there are these platforms called Kickstarter, Indiegogo uh, that uh, you can, I mean, I would, I would encourage you to like actually go on Kickstarter or Indiegogo and see, you know, what kind of campaigns people uh, create. But for example, for my shoe company, um, all I had to do was have a few pictures of the prototype. So I say, okay, this is the shoe I want to bring to the market. This is why this needs to exist. You make up a video that tells everybody why you're doing it and, you know, sort of give your backstory and just, um, and I mean, there is definitely uh, quite a bit of, you know, uh, initially you have to sort of spend three months or so uh, gearing up and getting, uh, you know, the demographic of people who are going to buy from you, you know, telling them that, okay, this is coming and I'm going to launch. But once you launch it on Kickstarter, for example, you have you you launch a campaign. It's thirty days, and you say, okay, my goal is. Uh, I mean, you you basically depending on you know how much money you need for launching. If I say I need ten thousand dollars because uh, the manufacturer that I'm, that I'm working with needs me to you know put in that at least order hundred shoes or whatever, right? So. Um, so that way you say, okay, $10,000 I need to raise and, and put it out there. And then there are people who will just pay you uh, to get the pro in exchange of the product at a later date. So you just say, okay, I'm launching. I, I If you pay me now, you will get the product six months from now, right? And so there are a lot, I mean, so that way, if you get, you know, 100 people giving you $100 each, you raise $10,000, right? So it's it's a way of, you know, people prepaying you uh, and they they prepay you because they want to, you know, support you. And then also because you also give them a better deal than, you know, when you would retail it. So if, if you're going to retail it for 150, you'll sell them at 120 on the crowdsourcing campaign. So that's so I I if your product is a, a consumer product that's the way to go, um, and then your second question about you know co-founder um, and uh, find you know starting a company um, I I I think you know most of the times it's really hard to uh, it's really hard to you know move ahead in in a startup uh, if you do not i mean you probably will not have all the skill sets so uh, you know you might be good at one particular thing but you like you said you know you don't know much about br uh, it's also sales marketing you know all these other different functions you so you need somebody who is complementary to you that can help you and yeah finding a co-founder is actually a very very hard thing i mean uh, i've had uh, and like, there is no good answer to it. Uh, it's mostly networking is what uh, I have done. Like, I mean, I just tell everybody about what I am doing and what I want to do. And then they're like, oh, I know this person and this might, you know, that, that can help you. So I, I think networking is the way to go in terms of, you know, find, finding the person 
who you want to work with. But um, I mean, there, you'll find a lot of resources of how to find uh, co-founders online. But yeah, I mean, it's it's it, that one is a hard one in general. It you know, there is a lot of advice out there saying that you know you should not work with somebody that you just met, and you know you need to work with somebody you know and trust. But you know, sometimes it's hard. Uh, you know, you might not have somebody in your network that you uh, w- that has the skill sets that you need. So you have to go outside and. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's super nice. helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Zeba. I love what you said about that. You told everybody what you're doing. Cause I, I feel like there's this startup culture where people are like, Oh, I can't tell you have to sign an NDA or, I, yeah. or if you want to know what I'm doing. And I kind of, I definitely subscribe to the, no, you should tell people what you're doing because nobody has the expertise or the passion to do it. Like people stealing ideas. That's like the stuff of movies. So anyway, yeah. I love that approach. Yeah. yeah. I, I totally agree with you on that. And I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, execution is everything. Like, I mean, uh, I think even if I tell everybody, okay, this is how I'm doing it, it's it's going to be really hard for somebody to get in and actually, I mean, it took me one year to even make a f- first prototype, right? So it's, yeah, it's it's kind of, you know, hard to sort of copy uh, you uh, or, you know, execute you, uh, execute as good as I you would. So I, I encourage people to just talk about what you're working on. That's fine. Yeah. Well, great. Well, it's uh, getting to be closer to the top of the hour. So I know that um, folks might have other places to go, but this has been a great use. I know personally of my hour over lunchtime. Thank you so much, Zabo. We learned so much and are really proud of all that you've accomplished and and, and that we were a little bit a part of your journey um, uh, over the years. So it's been wonderful to have you here today. Good luck. And I know that we'll be keeping in touch. So we, I know yeah. we haven't seen the last of you around here. So thank you so much.